Well, you may have heard of it, but how many of you watching this really know what the Commonwealth is? Even some of the people apparently living in member nations don't know what it does or why. Where is the relevance of the Commonwealth in the 21st century? Does it just provide a helping hand for developing nations or could it become a more powerful player on the world stage? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Last week, the heads of Commonwealth nations met here in London. Most of the 53 countries had been former British colonies. Times have changed. Has the Commonwealth changed with it? Fifty-three countries mainly united by former British rule, established in the late 19th century. The Commonwealth nations make up almost a third of the global population. But with many citizens unaware of what the Commonwealth actually does, how much importance does it have today? Do all 53 nations benefit from being part of the Commonwealth? If it dissolved, would anyone notice? Probably best known to the rest of the world for the Commonwealth Games, the nations are a mixture of former British colonies and current dependencies. Put simply, we are one of the world's great convening powers, a global association of volunteers who believe in the tangible benefits that flow from exchanging ideas and experiences and respecting each other's point of view headed by the Queen, with Prince Charles set to take over the reins in the near future. The Commonwealth includes some of the world's richest countries, such as Australia and Canada, and some of the poorest, including Tonga and Tuvalu. It supports member nations in areas such as health, development and advocating human rights. The Commonwealth played a pivotal role in championing the boycott of apartheid in South Africa, as well as ending military rule in Pakistan. At the 2018 Commonwealth Summit in London, the UK announced major funding plans, including more than $278 million to help keep girls in education, $61 million to help combat natural disasters, and over $3.7 billion to fight malaria. Malaria has a serious impact on the economies of countries it affects. The human cost is incalculable. So do developing nations gain more by being part of the Commonwealth? Some argue that the only country to really benefit is Britain itself, thanks partly to low corporate tax rates and access to poorer nations' key resources. The Commonwealth has been criticised for being an irrelevant institution wallowing in imperial amnesia, having little influence in the current global climate and no say on international affairs. While poorer nations get funding through the Commonwealth, are richer countries using this to their advantage, running things on their terms? With Britain scheduled to leave the European Union next year, will it be an opportunity for change in how the Commonwealth operates? Could we see other countries seeking to join? Or will we eventually see the Commonwealth cease to exist? I am delighted to say that with me at the round table we have David Martin-Jones, visiting professor in the War Studies Department of King's College London, also Rita Payne, who's chair of the UK branch of the Commonwealth Journalist Association. Kahindi Andrews is here, Associate Professor of Sociology and Black Studies at Birmingham City University and Humphrey Hawksley, author and former foreign correspondent for the BBC. Warm welcome uh, to each and every one of you. Rita, let me come to you first, because you're the only one in that list of people that I read out that has the word Commonwealth uh, attached to your name. I know you're not an apologist for it, but when you hear Commonwealth, what does it say to you? It was a big change for me, so when I was outside at the BBC many years, Commonwealth didn't mean anything to me at all. But having joined and come inside the tent, um, I see it as a concept. Um, I think it's something that nation, you know, uh, organisation, 53 member states, home to a third of the world's population. Um, it talks about common future, common uh, rule of law, beliefs, concepts. So it's aspirational. Well, do all jump in at this point and give you your opinions on it, but outdated? Um, you talk about the future. Is it, does it have a place in the future? Well, do you know, I've come to the conclusion that the Queen is very much part of the Commonwealth. And at the moment, Charles, out of affection for the Queen, I have a feeling this is why no one objected, 
after that, who knows, I agree with you, it may, it may just naturally disappear. But when I was at the uh, Buckingham Palace and saw the opening and all the summits and, and they all walked in, and it was wonderful to see, you know, uh, the heads of government from small island states like Tuvalu and Solomon Islands. But and this is all misty eyed, isn't it? A little bit. <laughs> you know, it, well, anyway, we can talk yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, candy. I mean, I think when, I think even that description you just gave is that's Empire 2.0. That's what Whitehall called the Commonwealth after Brexit, this idea that we're going to, Britain, it's a, it's, it's a neo-colonial institution for Britain to extract resources, low taxes, uh, to keep its nostalgic place as the leader in the, in the world. It's, there's no benefit but to it. Let, let's be fair, a long the time ago. summit, in that report we were talking about 200 million for girls, keeping girls in education, money for disaster relief, money for malaria. It's not just something that Britain takes from, it gives... Well, no, well, I mean, I Britain can... So, you know, it's yeah, not yeah. just Britain that wants the Commonwealth. Mm. Um, Britain's role in the Commonwealth for the last, you know, well, 15 years has been negligible. Um, it's countries like um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand that have seen real benefits from Commonwealth yeah. interactions. What, what do those countries have in common? But also oh. Singapore and Malaysia, who, who are not white old Commonwealth countries <laughs> at all. Humphrey, j jump in, because we'll get to your idea of more Asian influence a little bit later on, if, if we may. But, I mean, what, what do you make of what you heard so far? I, I think you, if we strip away the detail, I mean, because the Commonwealth, as you said in your introduction, I mean, nobody really knows what it does. Mm. That's not a bad thing, because that, it's not the UN, it's not the EU, it's not some big thing that's telling us all what to do. What you've got is you've got 53 countries, or less, because you've got <coughs> some that weren't British, that were colonised by Britain and went through repression, injustices, and all the sort of stuff that KND mentions. But they've come to terms with that. And they're coming here to come together under some sort of indefinable... No, but the, 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 the fact that they need to, need to use Western resources for things like educating girls or poverty relief tells you they haven't come to terms with this at all. Neo-colonialism, economic exploitation is just as bad now as it was... What about psychologically? Ago. Because what, you, what I'm oh. comparing it against in this uncertain world we've got now is the Middle East where everything goes back to the, you know, centuries and centuries ago, and they have the Balkans, uh, you know, where mm. everybody goes back to 1387 and the yeah. battles there. You've, they've had their repression, they've got the economic it's, imbalance it's, it's, and all the rest it of it. But it's not finished. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest lie of colonialism. Yeah, but if you, if you, you abolish the Commonwealth, finished, if it no longer existed, mm. those facts would still exist. But maybe, Therefore, what is the harm in it? There's definitely no harm in countries coming together. They should just not be coming together under a colonial British institution. But, but maybe they should be coming together but, but against maybe, colonial but British institutions. Couldn't it be that at the moment it's facing an inflection point, that on the one hand there is this old heritage of, you know, which you would see quite rightly as, as colonial. But if, if the arrangement is capable of reinventing itself in a, you know, a more multilateral and inclusive way, with India taking a more prominent role, for instance, as it wants to do. I mean, India's turned up for the first time at a Chogham, you know, meeting for 10 years. Now, that could be... Chogham being the Commonwealth Heads of Government. Yes. I mean, we all use... Yeah, the... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. 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 I got into an acronym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think the problem... I think the, the, that's a good idea. If you say to me, could the Commonwealth turn into this kind of third world revolutionary organisation? But of course it can't because that's not what it is. And you have this elite in India, the elite in Nigeria, the elite in the Commonwealth coming together under a British institution which is steeped in colonialism. It's, it just British cannot do the things it needs well, to do. Do you think it's changing? Well, it's... I think at the moment it hasn't changed enough there's potential a lot of people are very disappointed that an opportunity wasn't taken this time to re not, not to have Charles and to have someone else but the other argument... But you can't say no if the Queen who's the head of exactly. the Commonwealth think... says this is the one I want as much as... You could. No, no, but absolutely. It would fragment. Yeah. She's 92. She's 92. Yeah. She's held in great affection across the Commonwealth and I think people felt it would be a bit churlish especially when she said in an opening speech it is my sincere wish the child would take over. She wouldn't have said that unless she had known that... That they would have all supported her behind, so behind the scenes. Yeah. sort of meeting. And, well, why do you think it would be perhaps have been better not to have done that? I think it was mainly, again, the Queen at the moment. I think the Queen is the glue. There is no doubt about it with the Commonwealth. What happens later on, it was quite interesting, I was in a discussion because Philip Murphy has written a book about the Commonwealth myth 
of empire and but so he's on. the man who called it an irrelevant institution exactly, wallowing exactly. in imperial yes. amnesia so i was at a <laughs> yeah. get off the fence mr so i was at a book launch and he's the and director of commonwealth <laughs> institute yes. studies yeah. at the yeah. university and of paul yeah. uh, boateng was there and what he said is that actually he's been around everywhere and everybody where he went to the smaller countries they all love the queen and, and that's why they had no problem at the moment with the Commonwealth as it is. But he, what he said is rather than describing it as a legacy of empire, he said call it the product of empire, which means that's when you move forward. Hmm. Hey, and then you, you abandon it, right? The product of empire should be abandoned. And isn't it a bit worrying that well, the, the queen empire is the glue? Been abandoned, it? yeah. It'll probably oh, yeah. die away. It, at the moment, no one has forced people to join the Commonwealth. Oh, that's right. Well, so the there, there, there's no financial benefits. So why do people all come over? Why did Rwanda want to join? Why did Mozambique, Mozambique want to join? I, I like the wisdom of slowness on this mm. Because, mm. because if they had uh, rejected Charles, you would have had a sort of revolution and the whole thing would have probably fallen apart. And we've seen, you know, we, we're all of a generation, I hope, that we've seen what happened in Iraq and what's happening in Syria and all that when you try to do things too quickly. Mm -hmm. So Charles is not going to be around for, forever. And at that stage, maybe there will be a different system. And there will be an incrementally slow change where it will move out of the, the place where you correctly but, say it is and move into something. There will be, might be more Rwandas, more Mozambiques joining it. Yeah, but the fact, well, there's two problems. One is you talk about gradual change, but in many of these countries, children die under the age of five because they can't eat. So actually, gradual change is probably the last the thing they need. That's not the Commonwealth's fault, though, is it? Well, no, it's a part of a global system of neocolonialism, and the Commonwealth okay, is part of that system. Which is for another programme. No, but it's, it's, I, I, I think it is, it is no reason, because that's what the, the Commonwealth represents. Before we move on to where the Commonwealth might go from mm. here, and India's <laughs> growing influence, etc., etc. Kahindi, I'm not shutting you up, because I'm going to put this one to you. Uh, nations no longer ruled by force and fear, this is what you said, will not supplicate themselves to Britain because of misty memories of empire. That actually isn't happening, is it? Well, I think it's interesting when you say that so countries joining the Commonwealth is the biggest indictment of the Commonwealth because why on earth, if you say there's no financial, what do they actually get out of it? But because of, because of poverty in their countries, because there's another way of forcing people, this is why this no colonialism matters, they, they feel they have no choice to join this organisation which doesn't even benefit them. And I think this is the problem. And I think we need to have a different approach to global affairs where these countries take their own responsibility and, and the, the Queen, Charles, uh, completely irrelevant, should be completely irrelevant to, to, to these countries. So it's something else that, I mean, yes. Another it, program, another program. It's another program. Yeah. Well, it? I, I think and Kelly, you can jump in on this. Where is the Commonwealth going to go from here? You talked about India's influence. Yeah. Well, Modi think... comes over here first time in so many years that somebody's come to one of these meetings from, from India, which will be the centre of a future Commonwealth, no doubt. Because, I mean, it has roughly half of the members of the Commonwealth live in India. Well, in fact, 94% of Commonwealth population is from Africa and Asia. So that's quite significant, you know. So it's, what's it's India's what? role in this? Well, Britain no longer at the centre? Well, I think what's quite interesting, because I don't agree with Kandy's point about, you know, the... Well, if you're going to say the global structure is deeply unfair, this is true, but that's not the fault of the Commonwealth. It's equally the fault of other global arrangements, whether it's, you know, the World Bank, the IMF. And now, if you want to abolish everything and go back to year zero, well, that's one solution, but I don't think it will be very productive either. But today we're talking Commonwealth. Yeah, no, today exactly. We're so if we're looking at the Commonwealth um, as its that... Its future. Does, yeah. it, does it have as one? And if it does, is India going to be at the centre? If, it, if it's going to move forward, it has to embrace India and sub-Saharan Africa as part of its um, ongoing project of a potentially very interesting free trading arrangement. And does India see itself as the future leader of the Commonwealth, perhaps as a buffer belonging to all these, I mean, all these countries I, I, around you? Well, to, to I think other that, well, influences the, 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 the in the two points China, that, perhaps. Well, I mean, the, the points that become Do jump in. geopolitically in, interesting is that, you know, obviously you could say, post-Brexit, Britain needs somewhere else to go, global Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commonwealth is an obvious place, and Kiyundi would see that as it, its Empire imperialist not, building <laughs> exercise. But on the other hand, India is also in a strategically interesting position and sees a commonality of interest with a post-Brexit Britain in a way that could invent an arrangement, including Canada, Singapore, Malaysia, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and 
Pacific and some of the African countries in a, in a distinctively trading arrangement that offers a possibility for, you know, increasing trade and increasing global distribution mechanisms. You've talked about the Asianizing of the Commonwealth. Is, is that what... Well, it, it is in a way. I mean, the, the India's got a problem, though, because mm. it, it's had multiple chances of showing its leadership in the world, and it's, mm. it, it's catastrophically failed. Mm. Um, it hasn't... You know, it's lost the Indian Ocean to China, essentially. It's lost Nepal. It's lost Bhutan. It's lost Sri Lanka. Uh, it doesn't have a cohesive foreign policy. So to think that India could suddenly take the lead in this, even through value system or principles, let alone that, mm. is, 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 is not right. But what it, what it can do is this. If, if, if it goes slowly, I know you disagree with me on that, but if you go over a generational thing, it will give India a platform in which it can test its world leadership. Mm. It can see whether it can get around without bullying people as it has done in South Asia. It can be somewhere where China isn't. And it has got, and, and the other thing about the Commonwealth is that Although it is riddled with corruption and political repression and it kills journalists and the, <coughs> and, and the gay sex is illegal and all of that sort of stuff, um, the, the, the members of it have signed up to democracy and the building of human rights and in those institutions. They might not adhere to it, but they've signed up to it. And when you've got Russia and China coming up now and saying, no, we think authoritarianism is a better mm, way yeah. to go, you have actually got something, albeit on paper, mm that is balancing that out. How about this suggestion, that we take Britain and, and India out of it, just, just for the mm. next two mm. minutes, mm. and say, actually, it benefits country A to deal directly with country B. Uh, C, D, E. Trade is much bigger between these countries. I think you read So 19% right. yeah. yeah. bigger than it would be outside yeah. yes. of, the, of the Commonwealth. Yeah. So, so there is a benefit there, is there not? But it's, I, I think it's wrong. Come in in a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just think it's wrong to just think of trade and what we're talking about, the same big power politics. And with India, there would be all sorts of things you could point the finger at if India were to be heading the Commonwealth. What people forget and what impressed me is that climate change, as in one thing, which the Commonwealth could do is draw attention to what is the real threat that small countries are facing. Now, and it provided a platform, the Commonwealth, this gathering, when you had people from small, small countries, which may not exist in 10, 15, 20 years. They were able to come and talk about it. The foreign minister of Vanuatu was saying everything they eat has got plastic in it. And they themselves, are, they're not producing plastic anymore. They're trying to find ways to stop plastic from being brought in. And these countries would be nowhere. They're not heard in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And these are the people, so, and they matter. And the other thing, dimension, which there was, which is wonderful to see, people forget about the Commonwealth Foundation, mm -hmm. which represents civil society, civil society voices from across the Commonwealth countries. And what was amazing is having been to see all the glittering heads of government meetings, hearing writers, from some Lucia, Solomon Islands, etc. And they came and they were reading five minute excerpts from their work. And all of a sudden, the walls faded away, melted away. We were at the Queen Elizabeth Center, which is quite dry. Yeah. And they were, you could hear the cricket and you could hear the <coughs> sound of the sea from someone reading something. Yeah, but, and that was amazing. And I think that shared aspirations, idealism, people yeah, may but, fail. I think that's what the value well, I did show you yeah, no, but you I was saying, but this, it's a nice idea, but that doesn't actually solve the problems that these countries face. If you think of, talk about trade and who's, who does that benefit, that never benefits the poorer countries and I also think we need to understand that empire the legacy of empire is also in places like India where India is just because India takes over the Commonwealth mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's going to treat Africa any better than Britain treated Africa and if you have this system which is set up in this arrangement with this colonial history it's always going to perpetuate colonialism so India leading it or well, they're Nigeria talking about the rotating uh, leadership yeah. well, what, 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 what do you yeah. think India wants out of this um, a, to be at the centre, we've talked about as a buffer perhaps of other influences in that part of the world, but um, they're going to say to Britain, if you want us to take a bigger role, um, we need to have free movement of citizens yeah. back in the UK. So th there's always well, a price. There, there's always the, a price. The, the, the initiative came about a year ago. Mm. Britain decided to launch an initiative to get India into a free That's trade right. deal because it needs to deliver something to us, the voters, mm. on Brexit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, there, and it moved two very senior civil servants into the Commonwealth Secretariat to sort it out and streamline it and make it a better place in order to design it for this this this, this children thing. That's essentially failed, because India is saying exactly what mm. you say is that no, you know we need to you know you want to trade we can do the Commonwealth thing but actually trade is different and we need visas and we need this and we need that, and on top of that I think your point here is that the more we 
go to these countries, but you know, Kenya or um, India, the more they are going to say, well, hold on, how about the Amritsar massacre? Yes. How about the Bengal famine? Why don't you apologize for that before you, before you, and, <coughs> and so there is a risk of opening up a Pandora's box if we use the, the, the Brexit need Mm. for these relationships and mix the Commonwealth in for that and, and all. And also, even until, you know, years ago, a few years ago, even last year, India wasn't interested. The average Indian isn't really interested in the Commonwealth. In or, fact, or, or no, that's what I said at the beginning, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Who's got a clue? And the younger people, I mean, the BBC had a series of programmes, mm. spoke to young people in Jamaica and India, Nigeria, and, and they all said, we don't really know what it's about, we don't know but we don't know about the royal family, we're not interested. So I think we're probably seeing the start of maybe the Commonwealth fading away. Uh, but at the moment, the Queen, very, she's a bad it, political fray. What's it going to take for it to, to, to break up? To no longer, uh, not, not just not be relevant, but to no longer exist? I don't think it needs I don't think it'll break up, it'll fade. Yeah. <laughs> Because it doesn't do much. I mean, as we know, it doesn't have a high profile. Yeah. It doesn't do much. It meets yeah. every two years and it gets... It, 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 it doesn't need to do anything except be there. Well, but it's not, and it doesn't do any harm. And well, also it doesn't do any good, yeah. does it? I mean, we just had a perfect the example of the, it We have the Commonwealth, harm. you have mm. countries who were former colonies in the Commonwealth, and we just have a whole big case of the Windrush generation who came over as Commonwealth citizens, and if they can't get back in the country. So yeah, it tells okay, you if, if Nigeria and Kenya do a favour, and it's easier because they're both in the Commonwealth. Well, they, they should all, they, my point is that they should cooperate, but not within the, under this framework. But Humphrey says, you know, what's the harm in it? And also remember that they can all head the next summit. For example, Rwanda, the next summit is going to be in Rwanda. Well, and Rwanda dreadful. is going that's to be chair, chair for the, yes, you can say it's a dreadful <laughs> choice, but what I'm saying is that in different countries, yeah. it can move to, apart from yeah. Britain. If you took Britain out of it, it'd be great. Yeah. But, but then it's not the Commonwealth, yeah. is it? Well, well, I, I also well, spoke well, to why, about. you know, take Britain out of it? I mean, it just seems to me that... I mean, in a world that's got increasingly, you know, disturbing in terms of, as Humphrey said, the rise of, or you know, the revi revise the revision <coughs> of the, you know, the the powers like China and and Russia, uh, revisionist powers in terms of the world order, that we we face a, a very difficult uh, international situation. And arrangements like the the Commonwealth, which actually advocates human rights, trade, um, uh, you know, the disease prevention, eradication, education across the Commonwealth, Commonwealth universities. I mean, that's quite positive. I mean, and nobody has to belong to it. Anybody can withdraw. Isn't that the point? I mean, if, if, if it was that bad, why aren't all these countries leaving? Well, I guess uh, maybe, maybe you're, you have a, a much more positive image of Britain's place, a role in the world than I do. I think this but is you're being critical of Britain, not of the Commonwealth, aren't you? Yeah. Well, the Commonwealth is an extension of the well, Britain. Is the Kenya, legacy Kenya of the British Empire. Leave. You can't separate the two. Ken Kenya could leave. Nigeria could leave. And uh, Sri Lanka could leave. Any country and could they leave at any time. They should leave, but the fact that they're in this... But they must it doesn't benefit something them. tells you something yeah. Really really wrong with the global but what, what this I is not an attack <laughs> Kahindi program. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you of that. But what I, You're entitled yeah. to your view. <laughs> what I will say, uh, which is a big disappointment, is the government leaders. You know, you've got civil society who were asking and mm. clamouring for fairness and human rights. Government leaders are rejecting it. And one example is the Commonwealth Journalist Association, along with 15 other associations. Uh, we drew up principles on media and good governance. Mm. And, and they are really looking at how the separation of powers and how all the branches could work together to, with the media and you know, executive and judiciary um, can all work together to promote Commonwealth values. But the government leaders haven't taken it up. Now, when you say what's the way forward, that is the way forward. But it's it has no that. power. It, you know, no, you can say this is what we'd like to happen, but... But if the government leaders took it on board, oh, but this, this then it might improve when you talk about rule of law and all the different concepts. Well, if the governments are talking about, for example, if it's mm. held in Rwanda and Rwanda's got an authoritarian government, mm. it's exposing itself and people are going to really take Rwanda to task. Mm. Now, that means that Rwanda will both be in the uneasy position of being leading the Commonwealth for the next <coughs> years, being the chair and being tested. Well, and then I bring we, up. This is, I think we've all been in positions where people are in the spotlight and yeah. they say, well, we're going to change Indeed. in the moment you journalists leave. I think I'm agreeing with Kendi now. I've suddenly changed sides. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'd like to throw this out. Is yeah. it, and we only have a couple of minutes. Uh, is it a false 
badge of respectability, yes. i.e. you join the Commonwealth and yes. underneath that you kill your journalists and you, you, you have your authority. Well, I, I think that's, a, <laughs> I think that's a little unfair because you, well, you could say the same about the UN, couldn't yeah. you? I mean, at least the, yeah. um, uh, the Commonwealth has the capacity to suspend membership and it has done, you know, I mean, coups in yeah. Fiji, um, uh, you know, in Nigeria, um, Nigeria was uh, suspended over, you know, the murder of Ken, the journalist. Yeah, but I think this but is a problem with sorry, all of Sorry, chaps, I'm going to have to mm. say it's about mm. time to, to call. We can continue the conversation <laughs> outside. It's, got, it's gone so rapidly. I just wanted to bring this mm. uh, to the attention of our, our viewers before we go. This is from The Times, a leader from The Times. The British government and its officials need to remove the patronising lenses through which they have foggily continued to view the Commonwealth since the sun set on empire. Whether that is true or not, that's certainly one of the opinions that's been voiced by Kahindi here with Humphrey coming to join him a little bit toward, towards the end. I'll tell you what, we have removed the patronising lenses here on this programme. We've spoken frankly about the Commonwealth, its future, indeed, if it has a future. Thank you very much to all of you for coming on the programme. From me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team, hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>